This is Adventures in Queer Filmmaking. I'm your host, Nicole DiManessis. I'm a producer slash independent filmmaker working in the Bay Area. Our guest today is Michelle Elon. Michelle is an independent filmmaker and actor, best known for creating the first lesbian comedy trilogy, Butch Jamie, Heterosexual Jill, S&M Sally. Now, S&M Sally is one of my favorites, so we're definitely gonna talk about that one. Uh, and Michelle identifies with both the queer and DIY filmmaking communities. Much of her work satirizes gender, sexuality, stereotypes, and identity. Her films have screened in over 100 festivals worldwide, won 20 awards, and has been, uh, been sold to Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, Here TV, and many other outlets. But today specifically, we're here, we're, uh, thank you so much for taking the time with our listeners, but we're here today to talk about your new film, your new film, Maybe Someday. Let me give the log line for people who are unfamiliar with this new amazing film that's out right now, it premiered at CineQuest, so people have the chance to watch this film before April 17th. So the log line for Maybe Someday is, in the midst of separating from her wife, Jay attempts to move across the country to start her life over again. As she grapples with, with the inevitable cycles of love, loss, and everything in between. Now, uh, you're known for your comedies. I definitely love uh, the fur babies, the cat from the original movies, where uh, you're, you were a struggling actor, uh, also struggling against this cat that was uh, besting you in different, uh, different job opportunities. But in this one, you, you got to stretch your acting muscles, and it's a much more dramatic turn. And you know you're you you wrote this as well. You had a great producer, but you also edited this project. So I'd love to hear just the uh, the the inspiration for this project and what made you want to try something a little more dramatic as, yeah. as an actor or as a you know as a filmmaker. Okay, yeah. And first, thanks for having me on your show. I'm excited to be here. Um, so. When we shot S and M Sally, I think it was in 2014. Um, that was the th that was the fourth feature comedy that I did, the third in that specific trilogy. And at that time, I mean, the movies were a lot of fun, um, and I love doing comedy and I love screening comedy for an audience. But it started just to feel a little routine for me personally, and I wanted to do something completely different for my next project. And so it was about 2016 that I started writing the script for this. So I spent a number of years on the script and we filmed in 2019, which I'll get to in a second. But so first of all, I wanted to do something completely different. At the time, my way into the story was I wanted to tell um, a, a friendship story between a lesbian and a gay man, because I feel like we haven't really seen that a lot, but a lot of uh, important and influential people in my life have been gay men. And so that was my first way into the story was the character I played Jay and then Tommy who's in the movie. And so that's part of the movie. It's one part, it's like a third, I would say of the movie. Then from there, it kind of fleshed out into dealing with um, me coming out of a divorce and that's loosely inspired uh, by my own past relationship. I mean, I, I had a partner for a number of years and um, we separated and I moved cross country from one and to the other, kind of like the movie, but most of what's in the movie is purely fictional. It's just, that was sort of the emotional inspiration behind that part of the story. And so I fleshed that out. And then of course, um, the third part of the story is I stay with my high school best friend who I used to secretly be in love with, uh, Jess in the movie. And that's sort of the third relationship that's explored in the movie. So all of these characters and relationships are inspired by real life, but have been fictionalized to really tell this story that might have in one way or another kind of taken place over years of my own life that you can watch in 90 minutes and kind of synthesize it like that. I feel like a lot of lesbians or just LGBT people in general can relate to falling in love with a best friend or having uh, you know, a queer friendship that was motivating in them moving forward in their life or at least struggling through some issues. And uh, it's nice to see friendship depicted in a film. Real realistic context, I thought the friendship was organic and I enjoyed that storyline. There's also a great drag sequence with your friendship characters in it uh, that people I think will really enjoy. So even though the film is a drama, there are these really great moments of levity. I also really enjoyed, just in terms of, I feel like the, the the story of just your, the characters taking stock of themselves and trying to move forward and setting boundaries that helps with looking back on the past and those friendships that, uh, and those romantic relationships or at least um, early crushes that play a part in how, in, you know, how we fall in and out of love. It was interesting to see, you know, a young cast depicting those feelings. And you had a really great young cast. And I'm curious about just the process of finding people to embody these characters. Was it a struggle casting those characters? 
I mean, it was definitely challenging. So in the movie, we cast a younger version of my character, Jay, and then a younger version of Jess, who's the high school best friend. And we have some flashbacks of us in high school in the 90s, which were, were a lot of fun to shoot. But with, for casting, uh, especially for Jay's character, because I feel like Jay's character is very specific. I wanted someone who was believably queer that had the same kind of energy that I have in terms of like gender, but also like an intensity that Jay has. And like my character is very still in the movie and the idea is that a lot is communicated through the eyes and that the actor we found Eliza Blair like did that so well and in a lot of ways I think even better than I did of communicating so much without saying very much at all and so it was a challenge at first and I, I did think we would have to compromise because it's like okay this person has to you know look like me capture the energy be a good actor etc cetera, etc cetera. and of course there's the Jess's character but I felt like that was a little bit easier to play because um, you know, I just think like, I don't want to call her like your basic girl, but you know what I mean? It was, it's just a less specific of a character, right? And so the great news is in the end, I didn't think that we had a compromise at all. There was an actor that I was willing, that I, I don't want to say willing to settle on, but there was an actor we were thinking of casting. We called her back. And then my producer was like, well, we're only calling one person back. Let's just see more people while we have this casting space. Why not? And that's when Eliza came in and we just knew immediately that, that they were, they were, they were going to be perfect for the role. And the other actor, it would have been okay, but it would have been definitely like a distant second in terms of portraying that character. So I think we really lucked out, you know, cause we didn't work with a casting director or anything. And so a lot of times it's just the luck of the draw of who, who comes into the audition room and finds you. Well, and you know, uh this is independent filmmaking things happen and sometimes it is a bit of a, of a search you have to pivot sometimes you lose locations uh sometimes actors get sick so being willing to hold out for the right person for the role and it's very intuitive sometimes and it but uh, just in terms of uh the support team that you did have to make this project maybe you could talk a little bit about like this what a, this film has a really beautiful look because it is a road movie and so we're, we're, we're uh, in, there's some great wilderness scenes where your characters kind of, you know, just uh, getting back in touch with themselves, but also uh, getting in touch with nature, or at least becoming one with, uh, with nature and um, taking those moments for themselves. Uh, you can talk a little bit about scouting some of the locations, because uh, yeah, beautiful. Right. Well, well, thank you. I'm glad that um, that you appreciate those those scenes because I really wanted the location to feel a little bit like a, a character in the story. And so you know, my character's moving from the East Coast to the West Coast. And the idea is that I stop off in the middle somewhere and we never say where um, to get back up on my feet. So originally uh, I was thinking we would actually shoot it in the Midwest. I have family out in Missouri. I scouted Missouri, Arkansas. Then I did some internet scouting in Ohio, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, you know, when you have a tight budget, you, you do have to make choices. And my producer pushed for me to, to shoot locally. And I was like, well, maybe we could just do like two days elsewhere, like the exterior stuff. And the fall foliage was really important to me. And I didn't think we'd be able to get that here. The great news is that at the end of the day, we shot it locally, Los Angeles County, and then the next county over San Bernardino County. We found fall foliage because there's, you know, we back up to some mountains in the Angeles National Forest. So all of that, the little lake that we're in with the canoe and the fall foliage, there is some stock footage. And I think that also helps open the, so not every single thing's in LA, but every single thing that you see the actors in is here. And the Topanga Canyon, which is a part of LA County, is very rustic. And that's where the exterior of Jess's house was. And there's a lot of nice trees out there. And so it was the challenge finding those locations in LA because, you know, if you have the budget, you work with an actual location scout who might have some leads or know the area. And I'm not, I, you know, I hike occasionally, but I'm not like a hiker to the extent of really knowing. And so I did a lot of uh, just like internet searches and stuff and worked on that with my producer who su suggested the Angeles National Forest. And I was just surprised how lush parts of that are because, you know, LA can be a very dry, deserty, is dry and deserty, but then you'd have these pockets. And so just about maybe 20 or so minutes from my house is like another forest with like a river that we found. And so in the end, we saved a lot of money and logistically with a small team, of course, it's easier to shoot locally than if to try to find a local crew and, and, and fly everyone out to a different state also has its own challenges. Yeah, that's, you know, shooting smart and using your resources. 
Um, also for people who do go to CineQuest and, and visit, uh, get, to, get to watch it online. There's some really fun behind the scenes stuff with your other actors, uh, specifically the one playing Tommy and uh, not being comfortable in boats. And uh, I won't give away too much, but there are some very, uh, there's some cute behind the scene video that accompanies the movie and a little bit of the Q and A. The, the character of Jay, uh, you play a non-binary character. And um, was that something that you wanted to explore as an actor playing a non-binary character? Or was it important that um, you wanted to showcase uh, different LGBT representation in your film? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. I mean, I'm, I'm non-binary, so I think it was kind of an extension of, I wanna play my own gender. And also we don't, I think representation is definitely a part of it too, though, because we don't see a lot of that and we're starting to see more. And so I think contributing to that conversation was important to me, even though it's a very small part of the movie. And the younger actor uh, who plays my character, Eliza, is also non-binary, which was just actually a really perfect coincidence because like I said, like there were so many other challenges in casting of finding that right person. But the fact that they're also non-binary is kind of cool that we ended up both playing this character. Um, and anyway, so I was talking to them uh, and they're probably about 20 years younger than myself about like, you know, I was like, I like, I think representation for its own sake is important, but I was like, you know, I, I wasn't sure like how it would be received by the non-binary community because it's not really about that. It's not a very big part of the movie, but they were like, you know, according to them, based on like having read the script and watch, they watched a rough cut before we shot their scenes and they were like, but that's what's also so great about it is it's just showing non-binary people living their lives like everybody else is also really important. And so that was kind of cool to hear. And then another thing that happened the other day is uh, somebody on TikTok shared the trailer um, and a bunch of, to their non-binary fans and community, uh, mostly younger. And it was really cool to see younger non-binary people being really excited that somebody basically middle-aged myself, I mean, I'm in my early forties, was playing this character and they're like oh wow this is like you know the midlife drama we deserve and someone else was like I think this is the first movie where it's not a teenager and I don't know if that's true and there's a number of short films out there and um, some tv shows and things like that but um I thought that was cool that it's exciting for people younger to also see a little bit older representation too yeah and I also think there's there's value in naming it and I think uh you know I I'm a, of a, a close to your age as well. And so uh, I just feel like looking back, there wasn't the language for that. Maybe growing <laughs> up, maybe we, we, you're gay, straight, lesbian, and then, you know, bisexual, the, the stigma of different, different names coming later. So just uh, there's more language now. People can <laughs> identify in different ways now. And I think there's value in naming something and owning it, being proud of it. And like you said, it's a, it's a small part, but it's a part of the character. And I, it's nice to see the representation of, Here's a person uh, going through, uh, struggling, going through issues, but they're living. Their 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 goal is to strive and be a part of community, and so that's fun to see. Um, or at least we're relating to that struggle. We've all gone through mm -hmm. different struggles ourselves. So I think there's value in naming it. I think before there was kind of a trend in different LGBT films where let's just be as ambiguous as possible, and we're just going to have this character uh, jump from person to person, and we're not going to name it and. Uh, there are some people that might identify with that kind of uh, gender fluidity or, or sexuality, but uh, I do think there's there's uh, there's an important to uh, being that representation because it is it's few and far between in a lot of the media that we have, and this is uh, you know we've, we've we've stressed this this is an independent project, and so if you have the opportunity to put that into a character so there's a, an authentic representation or that you just you can connect more with that character, I think it's valuable, and uh, it, it's fun to see, and it, it's a small part, but it just adds a little more to the character and it's, it's it adds to the story so i think there was value in adding it and i appreciated that it was cool. there as well just because i've seen your other films it's fun to see a different side of you as an actor and um you know is there was there anyone that you work with you you like to uh, continually work with uh friends on on set but you have some new actors in this movie was there anyone that um uh maybe the the, the woman that was playing your wife was was that a hard a uh, role to cast as well? Or was that someone you had maybe workshop projects with before and, and knew? I did not know her. We held a uh, casting call for the wife. Uh, we saw a number of really talented actors. It, it wasn't a difficult role to cast. I mean, for that role, the most important thing was, I mean, it's a relatively small um, role in the movie, but it's important, right? And for that role, uh, first of all, I wanted a woman of color because I, um, 
I had already cast myself and the Jess character who's in my prior movies, we were already cast and we were both white and I wanted to add some diversity. And the Tommy character, we cast a variety of different races and ended up um, casting this, this gay white man. So um, it was important to me that she's a woman of color and it was also important to me that, I mean, the Lily character, even though they're separating, it was important to me that she wasn't, that people liked her and that she wasn't like the bad person. I, I felt like when I was separating from my partner, a lot of people wanted to be like, I'm on your side and they're in the wrong. And it's like, well, it doesn't need to be that way. It's complicated and this and that. And so I wanted somebody that ideally, hopefully, and I hope this comes across that feels like warm and honest and understanding and that you believe that Jay and this character, Lily, did have a really good solid relationship and it's fallen apart over the years and they've gone their separate ways. Um, but we only have a few scenes to really show that with. A more, a much more difficult character personally, I think to cast was the Tommy character who plays my gay, my new gay best friend in the movie. Um, because I think other than Jay, he has the largest, one of the largest parts in the movie. And I think other than my character, he has the most complicated role in the movie. So the Jess character is a little more like, um, what you see is what you get. She's a divorced single mom and she's helping Jay through a rough time and this and that. And she's got stuff going on, but the Tommy character, I mean, to me, there's layers to him and he's designed to be that way. And so for a couple of reasons, one is that um, the character of Jay is basically stuck in her life, right? And so, and I use, I use she, her pronouns for Jay because I use she, her pronouns for myself. This is just an aside. Um, the younger, the, act, the actor who plays younger Jay uses they, them pronouns. So I use they, them for them. So okay. that's why I just wanted to kind of add that in. But so for, for Tommy's character, so Jay is stuck in her life and not able to move forward, but it's very difficult. Anyone who's taken a screenwriting class, they say, make your character active. Your character needs to make decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Now you can break these rules, but you have to know about them and you kind of have to know you're breaking them and know what you're doing with it. So for me, it was kind of an instance of like, I want to break this rule of an active character. And Tommy, that's I think where Tommy comes in is that he ends up being a bit of the active voice. It's definitely Jay's story. I mean, Tommy's not taking it away from Jay, but he's the one who gets Jay to open up, to do things, to get out of her shell, to get out of her box and move forward. So he plays the active voice. The other thing that Tommy does is basically in a way I call him like the anti-hero. And by that, I mean, um, Jay's one of these people who's like always in a relationship. That's why this is a big deal that she's coming off of this, um, off of this marriage. And, and she's always been in love, et cetera, et cetera. And Tommy's the guy that's like, I don't know if I believe in love. I don't know if it's possible for me to fall in love. And so he serves as sort of like that opposite, sort of like the antithesis to like Jay's thesis of like, is it possible for people to fall in love? Is it worth it to fall in love? And so he's, he's also like basically this struggling bad, you know, amateur comedian. So it's like, he writes this line of like being overly confident yet underneath it all, he has insecurities. He's like kind of funny, but also not funny. He's entertaining, but then underneath it, there's darkness. And so for his character, and then of course we have that drag scene that you mentioned, so his was a, a tall order, I think, to fill. And uh, I think we we're really lucky to find Charlie, the actor, who was able to embody all of this stuff. Yes, uh, that actor did bring a lot of energy to the role. But I think uh, specifically the character of Tommy, he's stuck in other ways. Like, I think he, he likes the idea of possibly having one night stands or, or going to a club. But he's, he immediately tells your character, oh, let's go out. And then you just hang out at his house and drink beer. Um, so, and he's, he's definitely not, he's, doing some stand-up at the, taking the, the comedy workshop at the local church, but he's not ready for, he's not ready to hit the road. He's not ready mm -hmm. to leave that little bit of community where he has a certain amount of comfort. He can do drag on the weekend and he, he can uh, have a beer here and there at the local club, but he's not, he's not really ready to really stretch his wings. As much as we're, we're uh, I feel like Jay is going on that journey, Tommy um, is self-sabotaging and, uh, or at yeah. least self-defeating. And so it's that negative thought, uh, negative talk in his own head that uh, gets in his way. Um, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, so like you're saying, like there's a lot of different layers to him and he's loosely based on a friend that I had and I I tried to make, you know, it was it was hard because in earlier drafts, I, I, I made that character a little more obnoxious because of the kind of the way I imagined our friendship kind of sort of unfolding. And then the process of rewriting it, I, I took some of that away, but I wanted, 
but I still wanted to keep some of both. Like, how do I feel about this guy? I kind of like him. Oh, he's kind of annoying, you know, and there, a little bit of ambivalence there that hopefully I don't want to give away what happens to that relationship, but that hopefully, hopefully supports the trajectory that that friendship goes. Yeah. And that introduction of this new friendship, um, uh, there is a little uh, clashing of the old friendship of the, you know, she's, uh, Jay is staying at Jess's house and uh, Jess isn't a fan of Tommy. And <laughs> right. so it's fun to see a little bit of that clash. Uh, Jess is a character. There are some really fun moments of, uh, you know, there's a uh, cuddle workshops and there mm -hmm. is uh, another fun scene involving lotion. I don't want to give too much away because it's fun to see that play out. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, Jess is an interesting character of, um, you know, in uh, post-divorce and uh, trying to feel out if, uh, you know, her friend is going, is, is going to be in a similar uh, outcome as well. And mm -hmm. uh, the character of Jay isn't in the same place as her friend. And so that's um, interesting to see as well. So like you said, going back to different layers, the characters are in different places in their lives, but having this through line of, um, they have the history, the shared history of growing up together. And then there's this introduction of this new person, Tommy, who um, is a spark that Jay needs. But like I said, he, he's self-sabotaging and Jay, I think can pick up on that knowing. Uh, so there's a certain distance Jay is keeping there. Right, right, yeah. Uh, but very, I think they're clever characters, characters I think people will, will relate. Going back to the the, the wife character specifically, um, the uh, I feel like uh, the Lily character, that role, it uh, just it's great that you sh you picked an actress that uh, I, I feel like a strong actress that did say a lot with the look, did embody a certain character and brought a certain presence to that role. That even though uh, she's on screen for a short amount of time, um, we have that we have that um, vision of that character that can stay with us. So we we can empathize with Jay and what they're going through because that was a strong character. That connection, uh, we we see the little rifts that have gone on with that character, and uh, it's complicated. It's not yeah, it's not. Uh, you know, uh, Team J or Team Lily, it's more complicated mm -hmm. because people are complicated, especially if you share life with somebody and, uh, you know, not everything is black and white. Uh, but uh, fun characters, these are characters I think people will enjoy spending time with. Uh, I, again, I want to remind people, Cinequest, it's so easy and fun that it's online. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great films on there. I was, I was looking at, there's some really great international films on there as well. But uh, no excuse, you don't, even, you can, you know, wear your pajamas, stay at home, cuddle up and watch this really, uh, you know, involved drama with, with uh, if you uh, a fan of Michelle's earlier work, I think this is a really happy addition. And I really hope that it, it uh, uh, can you tell us about some other fun festivals that the, the film is making its way to? Uh, since this is the premiere? Uh, this is the premiere and uh, we just, we did get accepted to another festival the other day, but we're not able to publicly announce it yet. So the only uh, thing that we have publicly announced is CineQuest is going to do an in-person screening in San Jose in August. But other than that, we're, we're lining up screenings for summer and fall. Um, a lot of festivals, unsurprisingly, have, have closed down due to COVID and they haven't gotten back up. I don't know if they will. Uh, I think they took a financial hit. So, um, but there's definitely a lot of festivals still going strong. And, and so that's uh, the plan is to do that for the rest of the year, hopefully. Oh, that's great. And also, I know Les Flix is going to uh, be doing a great Q&A with you this weekend. I will make sure to put the link in the show notes uh, if people find this conversation on YouTube, or I will try and put the link for that on Instagram. People out there get a chance to watch maybe see someday uh, uh, online at CineQuest, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then the Q&A will be on Sunday, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And people should watch the movie ahead of time so we don't spoil yeah. anything for anybody. Again, uh, I, I love that you're, you know, this is the fifth feature film of yours. I know it's exciting that this the, the film had its premiere. Uh, what happens next? Have you reached out to distributors or is it, are you hoping to find a distributor while the film goes on its festival run? We don't yet have a distributor. I have somebody in mind potentially, but I'm going to see kind of what happens during our festival run. And I don't want to release it until next year. So I'm not necessarily going and trying to set those deals up now. Festival runs are, have always been really helpful for me for PR, word of mouth, that kind of thing for a small movie like this. And so I don't want to rush it. And so we're looking at like a wide release sometime next year, I would say. That's great. Having films find homes, at least for uh, a limited time on maybe Netflix or Hulu. Any advice for filmmakers working with sales agents or have you gone to AFM before or different film markets to try and pitch projects or pitch different, different films to find homes for them? Yeah, you mean completed films or like ideas for films? 
Uh, both. Yeah, I think it, at, you're in a uh, stronger footing if you're if you're coming with a finished film. But there is, sure. it is also available if people, hey, I got an idea, who wants to give me money. Yeah, know. right. For sure. I mean, I haven't gone to personally pitch uh, ideas and development, but I'll, I'll just say that that's tricky. Uh, somebody I know uh, did try to do that and kind of almost made something happen. But I think completed films are generally, you know, what gets sold at places like AFM. And I've worked with distributors and sales agents that... Um, that shop that on my behalf. Um, so I haven't personally gone to shop it. In terms of working, you know, with a distributor or sales agent, like I'll say this for my first movie, I signed all rights deals with a sales agent for international and a domestic distributor here in North America. And that that was fine for my first film. And this was also many years ago before filmmakers really had access to kind of distribute things directly on their own. And as time, cause this was way back in like 2008, right? And so now um, I'm a big fan of hybrid distribution deals where um, you give some rights to some companies, you save some rights for yourself and et cetera, et cetera. And so my past films, I have like a traditional distributor. I also work with an aggregator called Film Hub. And then I also shop the film myself direct to certain platforms. For this new movie, um, I may or may not work with a traditional distributor, but even if I don't, I would still partner with a company um, that's maybe functions more like an aggregator or like a non-traditional distributor where um, they take less money, um, you take on more work as a filmmaker, which I feel personally comfortable with. Uh, because a lot of times you're paying, uh, if you know what you're doing, a lot of times you're paying distributors to do things that like you, you don't really need to pay them to do, to be honest. But if you're newer, sometimes that's less intimidating. You know what I mean? But there's companies out there like Indie Rights um, and the Film Hub that take 20%. There's no expenses and they can get it out there on a lot of the same platforms. And so that's starting to be a lot more attractive than a traditional distributor that built in a lot of expenses in addition to taking a larger fee. So it just kind of depends if you feel like a company can do more for you than another company. Now, I know in the past for uh, some of your films, you did a lot of crowdfunding. Did you do a crowdfund for this one? Was there a different approach to raising money for this film because it was a drama? Oh, well, it's not because it was a drama. I mean, I um, this film was basically funded. Um, my mom passed away in 2019. And so I used some of that money that I received to fund this film. And so that was kind of fortunate for me because I had other before that I was still planning to do. I mean, obviously unfortunate, but like it was fortunate that it ended up kind of being able to be funneled in this, right? I'm sorry, sorry for your loss, but I, uh, I'm i assuming she was a supporter of your work and- Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think like, cause I remember her saying one day like how she wished that she could help more, like, you know, she'd help, you know, with my films and everything, but I think she wanted to do more. And so it's kind of, I felt like it was kind of nice that that, that ended up being able, and so I credit her as an executive producer and we have an in memory by her name in the end credits. Um, and before that, I was, um, my mom was also helping me like sell. I was like, I had this idea of like, I'm gonna try to sell like things on eBay from my childhood and maybe I'll make enough money to do a movie. Like I was, and we were going to pawn shops together. And so it was kind of that, that uh, then, you know and that we made, you know, a few hundred dollars but I thought it would also make a good story to tell. Um, each film actually, I approach a little bit differently. I did crowdfund s and Sally. The first movie didn't cost a lot, it was credit card. Second movie didn't cost a lot, it was paid for by the first movie. None of them cost a lot, this one cost more. And then the third movie I crowdfunded and you know, it's good to do it at least once um, to know what it's about, but it's, after it was done, I was like, I really don't wanna have to do that again. And so that's why I was trying to sell my stuff, on, originally sell my stuff on eBay. And I was going to, I also had this idea of like kind of doing a campaign in lieu of a crowdfunding campaign to be like, hey, do you wanna support my movie? Well, if you watch it on Canopy for free, they uh, bring movies to libraries, I get a dollar. And so kind of this idea of like, you can also support filmmakers by like watching their work sometimes at no cost to you. But at the end of the day, I feel very fortunate that we were able to move forward and green light it so quickly. I do wanna say one thing like, cause I touched on this earlier about how we started shooting in 2019. So we started filming this in the fall of 2019 cause I wanted to get those autumn colors. And so we, um, we rushed it so that we're like, we're gonna start filming with these three days. And then, uh, so we did it piecemeal because myself and my, my producing partner, David Al, are really the, the two people who were working on like pre-production and like launching this thing. 
And so we had like three days we shot in the fall and then we geared up to do a week in November and a few days in December. And then we had four more days for the flashbacks that we were gonna film in spring of 2020. And we took off that time between December and we didn't take it off, but we took it off from the shoot December in the spring to gear up for that leg of the shoot and to do casting. We waited to cast locations and stuff and we had that ready to go. And then we obviously ended up canceling that two weeks before. Um, and then finally, and then about a year later, one of my actors, we had a pickup shoot, was going to move to New York. We filmed him in uh, April of 2021, but right after we got vaccinated, but then did the last four days in August of 2021. So we took off, you know, a year and a half. Uh, and so total, it was almost two years filming this movie. So it was like amazing when we finally finished. But for me, I think it was interesting because I had that time to edit the movie, you know, I had a nice solid rough cut, really think about it. And I do think that the flashbacks are better because I had that time and that space uh, and the context of editing everything so that when we got back on set, I just, I just felt like I, it just was better because of it. And I can't like point to one thing and say that's what was better, but I just know that it was in terms of just letting it simmer like that and having the opportunity to watch the movie that way without it. Sometimes it is a mad dash just to finish when you're in production mode. And like, if exactly. you, you only have 12 days and you know, people want to cut their hair or people are moving and mm -hmm. you have this limited window of time to make magic happen. It, mm -hmm. uh, it is bizarre when that gets stretched over whether, you know, uh, you know, worldwide pandemic stops things for everybody and you have to pivot. It's good. It's good to have that space in between. But it sounds like since you, you edit a lot of your other projects that you, you were going into different uh, shots spending time with this footage, um, you had a plan to begin with and uh, it, extra time did seem to help. Yes, for sure, yes. I wish the film all the best and I hope uh, it, it finds its audience. I hope it continues to get great reviews. I saw a fun thing on Instagram, 100% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, so that's fun, fun as well. Um, but uh, what, uh, what's next for you? Are, are you hoping to do uh, uh, another narrative or are you really focused on this new documentary, Queering the Binary? Yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm interested in 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 doing my first documentary. It's actually going to be a series, a docu series, called "Querying the Binary" about non-binary identities and experiences. And so my partner does research. Um, they're not a filmmaker, but I've sort of converted them. And so their background is research and surveys and data and stuff like that. So we're combining our our skill sets. And so about a year ago we sent out a survey and we had 2,500 non-binary people around the world uh, take the survey. And so my partner's um, compiling that data that we can infuse into the documentary and to inform us as filmmakers of like, uh, maybe some topics or trends that we wanna focus on and highlight. And so we'll have different themes for each episode. And it's kind of nice for me, you know, as a narrative filmmaker, because like, you know, doing a narrative film, well, first of all, it's very expensive. It's, it's hugely time consuming. I mean, I've been working on this for years, right? And I always feel afterward, like a little bit like I'm tapped and I need some time off, right? And so it's kind of cool to go into this other project where I get to stay creative, but it's not like gearing up for a huge, huge thing. Cause right now it's gonna be just the two of us going out there to shoot with people interviews and things like that. And we're gonna, you know, keep it small. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to bring what we were talking about before about more representation. I wanna show a diversity of people. I wanna show some like trends and themes, but definitely just a diversity of people um, and make something for the community as well as people outside of the community to, to enjoy. No, that's exciting that you keep pushing yourself as a filmmaker and doing new things. I uh, love that you're, you're getting to work with your partner. I think that's always wonderful. Yeah. Um, uh, any advice for filmmakers? Just uh, like you said, you, you had to kind of stay motivated. These projects sometimes take years. Mm -hmm. um, what, what advice maybe works for you and any advice for filmmakers that might be struggling with, uh, you know, life happens and, and things, things come up and how do you stay motivated? Right, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because you know, for my, what works really well for me and a lot of people, you know, what I really personally believe in, I think this is challenging for, for creative people is I pick one thing and I'm saying like one project and I'm like, this is it. I'm going to make this happen no matter how long it takes and it's going to be done. Right. And so from 2016 to now, 2022, other than we did a little bit with the query and the binary during the pandemic, cause this was on hold. 
Um, this was the one thing I'm like, I'm going to see this through to completion. And so for a lot of people, you know, especially creative people, they have all different kinds of ideas and they want to work on all different kinds of things. Now, if that works for somebody, great. But I think oftentimes what ends up happening is nothing actually gets done because they're pulled in too many different directions. And so you have to find something that you're passionate enough about that you can commit to if you want to do feature films. I mean, it's such a long haul because even with this movie, it looks like it's done, but then with promotion and stuff, it's still another year that I'm going to be kind of working on this. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's sort of like that. I mean, there's a lot of sort of different advice depending on kind of where somebody's at and, and, and everything. But now with the affordability of technology and with iPhones, it's so easy to get started because, I mean, you know, a lot of it is like baby steps. Like there's no way I could have done this project years ago, right? And so it's like, you do an iPhone, you shoot a short, you make it small, you make it cheap, you show it to people, you get feedback, you get better and you build your skills and your confidence and then you can grow and you can build and then eventually take on stuff that one day would have seemed daunting to you, you know? Yeah, I, you know, I just, I think there's benefit in hearing the stories of other filmmakers, uh, you know, big borrowing and stealing to, to get a project off the ground, especially if it's their first, even if there's, if they're, if it's their fifth, it's still hard. Uh, mm -hmm. We've yet to have like the lesbian Robert Rodriguez who's selling their body for, for science or making movies with their little dog. And, you know, it's just, well, it's sometimes not exciting. Sometimes you have that day job and then you are uh, filmmaking on the weekend or, uh, you know, uh, you're selling stuff on eBay, <laughs> having, having your mom do craft service. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a, a mom that sometimes she, she actually, she wants more screen time in the movie. I'm like, you know, I'm putting her in a zombie mask or I made her be a homeless person. <laughs> so I have a mom that loves me. So, out, you know, yeah, uh, so the cute. best resources is our mamas. So if people uh -huh. have a great mom in their corner helping with their, their project, all the better. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, we, so you got to be a little crazy to be a filmmaker. I'm a little crazy. Mm -hmm. I think there's a little bit of craziness in you, just uh, the stories that you want to tell, the people you're working with and just making stories that connect. Yeah. With for sure. And also, I think a little obsessiveness, too, helps to to really be like, got to get it done, got to get it done. You're focused on an idea for years and years and years and coming uh -huh. back to it, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, are you are you just in terms of representation or is there is there any queer show you're currently binge watching or anything you want to give a shout out to that that uh, is on your must watch list right now? Well, it's OK. It's not current. But one thing that I felt like not enough people were talking about was work in progress. I only like season one, season two. I didn't like, but I loved work in progress and I felt like it got overshadowed by the L word. And it's a really nice alternative to the L word. And I love seeing different queer characters on screen um than the l word or similar shows like that so i love that show and i think it's uh funny and um yeah just love seeing different types of queer characters on screen i thought that first season was really strong as well the second season i feel like a lot of shows just decided let's not ignore the pandemic let's make it a story point and so it wasn't as funny it was hard to be funny mm -hmm. <laughs> uh and then they also uh pivoting uh there's some really great producers on that show i know uh, lana wachowski is one of the producers and uh, yeah, really strong first season. The second season had some fun cameos from uh, uh, the characters crush from Law & Order. So that was kind of fun, but, oh. uh, but yeah, highly recommend that first season. Uh, the idea of accidentally killing your, or thinking you accidentally killed your therapist is kind of funny. <laughs> and the obsession with almonds and having, I thought they had a really uh, cute young love interest. And that was fun mm -hmm. to see them explore. Very strong first season. Uh, and I like uh, the, the episodic uh, 30 minute works really well. It's fun. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't always have an hour. <laughs> so right. Uh, keeping, it, keeping it light and moving. And there were some really fun characters on that show. There's, uh, there's a great show on HBO Max called Sort of, and it follows a non-binary. Uh, right. Yeah, character. I saw that. There's uh, made by some great Canadians. And uh, just in terms of uh, representation, I hadn't seen a character that had just fun sensibility uh, in the representation. And I like seeing the cultural differences of uh, them navigating the world with uh, being a nanny, the pushback from family, the mother, the sister, and then their love interests and how that how they navigate their storylines. And so fun show. I hope it gets a second season. I, <laughs> But uh, uh, again, other shows making the rounds in, in festivals and stuff that if you get a chance, support these shows. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's new content being made every day. Over the course of uh, your career and just building your team, uh, I think a lot of people struggle with finding the right team to work with. And there has to be a certain level of trust in making a movie. And when you make a movie with someone, uh, you can, you can, like, you, you, you can uh, not see them for a couple of years, but when you see them again, it's like, 
what's up? You know, cause you uh-huh. share that, you share that experience with them and there's this connection. Um, so maybe any advice for uh, working and collaborating with other creatives uh, for people who are just starting out and looking for those collaborators? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, it's very challenging. I'm going to admit it's very challenging. Um, I don't know if I have advice really because I feel like I'm still learning myself because it's like you interview someone, you think they're one way and then you work with them and you're like, oh, I should have asked him this and I should have looked for this. I personally, you know, working on a film is can be really stressful and I don't ideally don't want it to be. And so I like when I meet with people, I try to find someone who I think is kind of chill and not super, especially like if it's somebody like a director of photography who def- sometimes if you find someone as a DP who's like really headstrong, there can be a lot of headbutting on set with the director. And obviously you want someone to challenge you and bring out the best in you and not always just say, oh, sure, sure. But you want somebody who's going to set the right tone and the right vibe and not be um, you know, too, (laughs) you know, too much. Right. And so I, it's really difficult because I think like a lot of times, you know, I think like in terms of like people who are type A, right. Really like on top of it, but kind of, you know, uptight. And then people who are top type B who are like laid back and fun, but then sometimes they let stuff fall through the cracks. And so, um, good people, especially like good producers, ideally need to be a mix of both because you want them to be on top of it and on it but you want them to also be easygoing. And so I'm always constantly looking for that and somebody that's gonna be communicative, of course. And it's hard saying how to get that right because I still struggle with it. But when you find somebody that you love working with, keep them because I, you know, it's very hard to find somebody that you're gonna, that you're gonna jive and gel with. I just think it's, it's almost like finding somebody to be in a relationship with. It's such a unique and intense relationship that you have when you make a film with somebody yeah if you need that work wife or work husband <laughs> yeah because uh, you do you do spend a lot of time with them and uh, uh but uh, the best collaborations are having that open communication and you know if you're a good person people yeah people want to be around good people keeping it light uh fun and um uh being a value on set if you're new a new filmmaker uh you know just getting on set as a pa and and adding value to a production that desperately needs <laughs> Uh, you know, production value or, you know, that extra PA goes a long way. Um, mm-hmm. Is there, uh, curious uh, if you have a favorite queer film that people maybe haven't heard of or, or, uh, or is like a lesser known one, uh, known one that you'd like to give a shout out to so people can find that one? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's my favorite queer film, but I think what's a lesser known queer film that I enjoyed when I saw it is called Women Who Kill. I don't know if you heard, it's kind of like a dark comedy. No, I've uh, seen it on Shudder. It, uh, it is, Uh, It is, it's interesting that the setup is like it, their, the relationship is broken. They still have to work together because they have a podcast. Right, right. They have a very specific storyline. It it is an oddly dark comedy. I think I remember seeing it specifically on, I remember finding it on Shudder. And so Uh, it wasn't necessarily marketing the LGBT aspect of it. But uh, when you look at the director and the star, uh, it's known. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, that is an interesting one. Yeah, that's a good shout out. (laughs) Um, so again, people, you can you can check out uh, maybe someday at CineQuest. Uh, please watch the film and then join uh, Michelle for her Q and A with Lesflix on Sunday. Uh, Michelle, it's been great to have you and, ta- and talk your ear off on your projects. Um, you know, is is there a way people can support your projects? Can they donate and buy you a cup of coffee? Do you, do you want to uh, tell people how they can connect with you either professionally or just to maybe reach out and tell you that they loved your film? Yeah, I mean, I think the best way to support projects for me anyway is to rate or review us on whatever website you're on. I'm right now I'm plugging IMDb actually because one of my uh, distributors said they've had platforms come to them and say, we'll take any movie you have that has a certain number of ratings. And it doesn't even matter if it's well rated, which, you know, is one of those things. It shows that it's popular and people are watching it and you don't even necessarily have to write a review, although of course that helps too. So right now I'm sort of plugging like, you know, rate us on IMDb. Um, In terms of my social media, you can find Maybe Someday at Maybe Someday Film on Facebook and Instagram and Maybe Someday J, J J-A-Y on Twitter. And you can connect with us and see uh, hopefully you know the film might screen locally for you or when we get a wide release next year and keep updated on all that 
That's great. I also want to say uh, with IMDb specifically, it's kind of like Amazon reviews. Try to make the uh, ratings a little more honest. So sometimes the reviews that are like 10 out of 10, they just throw out. Um, because uh -huh. like, come on, 10 out of 10. You know, so I mean, eight, we love an eight, right? You know, uh -huh. Uh, but uh, but yeah, because uh, I, I feel like uh, sometimes they'll look through that and be like, ah, oh, who's who's friends and family are writing me? So <laughs> right, right. let's keep them honest, guys. Keep some uh, you know nice reviews and uh, please reach out, reach out and support Michelle's work. Michelle, thank you so much for everything that you do, and I just wish you so much success. I hope you have a really fun time with this film and uh, just getting it out to the world and uh, wishing you luck on the next one as well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for your time today.